to see a young person going into the ministry Amen. and devoting their life so that others could be edified in the Lord. Um, it's a great undertaking and, and one I know you will do a wonderful job with. And I thought for today it would be a really appropriate thing for us to look at a couple of things. First and foremost, what is God's purpose for the local assembly? And then how does the Lord use, in particular, people to perpetuate church history? Now, kind of bear with me because this will be very pertinent to the ordination that we're about to see and uh, are privileged to be witness to. If you go with me to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1, now at the outset I want to say this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, right? And all scripture can be used to, to build a doctrine. Right? Uh, we have to make sure that we rightly divide the scripture and we keep the scripture in the context of how it's being used. But there are certain things that are going to be true everywhere you are in scripture. Uh, for instance, we know that God detests sin, and it doesn't matter where you are in scripture, he detests it. We know that God rewards faithfulness. Now, the outworking of faithfulness may be different, but the fact that God rewards faithfulness will be true everywhere in Scripture. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind today, because I'm going to look at some passages in Acts later on. Yes, Acts is a book about the fall of Israel. It's not a book about the beginning of the church. Not a book about how God created the body of Christ or any of those things, because that information is found in Paul's epistles. But there are some things in Acts that are beneficial for us to understand. And one of those things is how Paul established churches so quickly. Okay? And, and there's a lot that's in the book of Acts on how we did those things. But we begin here in Ephesians 1, verse number 8. It says this, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, from these verses we can establish a, a really important point, in, in that God he has a purpose. God has a purpose when he sets out to do something. He's not like us where we look at something and we say, eh, if I do this, maybe this will happen. God sits down and purposefully thinks things through. And he weighs out each and every contingency that could possibly occur so that he has an answer for each and every contingency that ever could take place. God has a purpose. Now he says here in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after what? The counsel, the counsel of his own will, right? In other words, God has a counsel with himself on how he's going to bring about the fulfillment of his will. And he talks about predestinating us. Now to us there is a plurality not talking about individual idea, but a corporate idea. And the idea is that he predestinated the body of Christ to something. He has a purpose for the body of Christ. And it's to work out the counsel of his own will through the body. Everybody with me so far? If you go to Ephesians 2, look at verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, it's interesting. We are his workmanship. <coughs> the idea here is, is almost the idea of an architect uh, with, with a blueprint. We're his blueprint, so to speak. He's the architect. 
And the word ordained literally means to appoint. We've been appointed to good works. Um, if you go with me to chapter 4, in verse number 12. <clears throat> chapter 4, verse number 11, I'm sorry. 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now we understand that gifts today have ceased. Yes. There, there are no gifts today. They've been replaced by a completed word of God, and the purpose of those gifts are no longer necessary. Uh, part of the reason why gifts functioned in the early church was to provoke Israel. But when Israel was set aside and God was fully done with her, we don't read of anybody being healed anymore, supernaturally. In fact, even in Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to stir up the gift. It's not something that just comes naturally anymore. He has to labor at it. But at the time here, he's talking about this idea of giving gifts, and there were some supernaturally empowered individuals who could be apostles, supernatural empowerment for prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Those were all gifts. The gifts have ceased, but the work continues. And the reason the work continues is that, verse number 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Come down with me, if you will, a little bit further in the passage to verse number uh, 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom? The whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. How does the body get edified? Itself. Through itself. Now, one of the very most important areas on how that begins is with the people who have been appointed to perfect the saints. Now, bear with me here. I want to go to an example in the book of Acts on how Paul established a church and how he did it quickly and how he was able to perpetuate so that we here in the year 2014 can be sitting, listening to me talk, but rejoicing in the fact that somebody else is going to be going into the ministry so that they can perpetuate church history. Yeah. In Acts 14, we have an account here. Now, most people really are familiar with the fact that Paul is stoned here. And, and we focus on that. I've heard so many messages where people just really focus on, on Paul being stoned and, you know, the fact that he got up and they'll typically take you into 2 Corinthians 12 and, and elaborate on it that way. And they miss some wonderful things that are said here. In chapter number 14 of the book of Acts, chapter 14 of the book of Acts, let's start at verse 19. <clears throat> and there came hither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Albeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium in Antioch. I want to stop there. The first thing that's important for any local group is to evangelize. 
In fact, it's interesting, the concordant version actually translate that as evangelizing that city, is the way it renders it. To evangelize. Now, what does that mean? Simply, it's the proclaiming of the good news. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's the way that the Bible calls it the glad tidings. Right. Um, there's some translations that will translate it as as good news. Others will translate it as gospel, and still others translate it as the word evangelize. The idea is to evangelize. Now, how how much should this burn within a person's soul? Well, in Paul's soul, it burned so much that he was stoned, supposed to have been dead, dragged out of the city. He gets up when his students are looking around about him, goes back into the city, and proclaims the gospel back in the same city that just stoned him. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you. I'm thinking twice about going back into the city. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's the purpose, first and foremost. In order for a local church to exist, it has to have members within it. Now, all people, all people who believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and trust that, are members of the body of Christ, are they not? <clears throat> we don't differentiate that. Local assemblies are intended for the saints to come into. It begins with taking the word to the unbeliever, to proclaim it. In the book of Colossians, keep your hand here in Acts. If you go with me to Colossians chapter number 4, now Colossians is written after God has been done dealing with the nation of Israel. It's, it's a later writing of the Apostle Paul. And he says here in chapter number 4, verse 3, with all praying for also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. To make manifest means to reveal or to proclaim something, to, to, to reveal it so that it can be understood, to enlighten. And... You're now taking on the task where this is a responsibility that begins with you and then goes to everyone else from your lead. Um, you've had a great teacher. One person I, I, I look at that I have, I revere as a brother in the Lord. And he's a wonderful example on how to function in that ministry, to evangelize, <clears throat> to just engage people in conversation to ask for that door of utterance to be given so that you can boldly proclaim the truth of this dispensation of God. What is that truth? That God dealt with sin once for all time, never to have to deal with it again. Yeah. That He loves us. That He died for us. That He rose from the grave for us. That, that He is not angry with the world anymore, but instead is trying to consile the world back unto Himself. And that we, we have that glad message as missionaries to go out wherever we are and proclaim that. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we see this idea. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to, unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Who's to us? The body of Christ has been given to us. And it begins with the lead of the people who are in charge of those local assemblies. And they're to take that word out, that message of conciliation to a, a world that God, <clears throat> notice what it is in verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Well, what does that mean? It means this, that God was in Christ. In other words, who's Christ? 
God. <laughs> right? God's in him. He is who he is. That he was reconciling the world. Rotherham has a world unto himself. The world's being bought back out of sin's bondage. He's bought it back to himself. Not imputing, not charging to their account their trespasses. Why is he not charging it to their account? Because he took care of it on Calvary's cross. It's not an issue anymore. Right? And he hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, or conciliation is actually a better word. Reconciliation. Notice the next thing. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Do you know that word ambassador is the idea of an emissary sent out with a message? And there's a number of translations that actually will translate that word not as ambassador, but as missionary. I think missionary catches the sense better. As missionaries sent out, we're to proclaim the word of truth. We're to proclaim it. Why? Because we're acting in Christ's stead or on his behalf. We're his emissaries proclaiming the terms of peace. God's not angry at the world anymore. He hasn't been angry at the world for almost 2,000 years now, give or take when you have the crucifixion occur. He's not angry with anyone. That's right. Not at all. In fact, he loves everyone and wants them to understand the depths of his love. And if they don't understand it in this life, they will later on. Right. But it's our message to go out with that news to tell them. Broken people, especially this time of year. This time of year is typically a joyous time for most of us. But it's also the time of year where there's more suicides committed. And it's a year of heartache for some. And we have a message that can heal the broken hearted. We have love that can reach those who feel unloved. And it's the work of the local assembly to evangelize in that kind of way. Back in Acts chapter 14, there's a second thing that the local assemblies are given to do. Let me see that in verse 22. <coughs> Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now the word tribulation means tempt testing, trials, that sort of an idea. But notice what he's saying here, confirming the souls of the disciples. Well, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, I want to say that Paul never talks about us discipling anybody. That's a dispensational term. Yes. Okay. But, just so you understand it. But the principle here is true. <laughs> Okay, to confirm the soul. In other words, you've evangelized an area. The next thing is to bring them into some place where they can learn the Word of God. Where they can encourage one another in the Word of God. We call that the local church. The local church is not a place for non-believers. It's a place where the believer goes to be encouraged and exhorted. It's a place where the, the believer goes to have edification. One of the, the second point of the local church is the ministry of edification to itself. And we read in Ephesians chapter 4 that the body is to make increase of itself. Out of itself, it's to build itself up. We don't need to go out and, and go into some bar and drink heavily to feel that we 
get rid of our problems. When we have problems, we go to the other saints. And if you go with me, I want to read back again Ephesians 4. Stay here in Acts, though, as well. Ephesians 4. Now follow, follow this passage here very carefully. Verse 15. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. Let's stop there. Every time I read those words, I think of a picture frame. You ever see a really good wood picture frame? You have a piece of wood coming across and you have the wood coming up and they meet at a joint. And the way they get that joint to stay together is they glue it and then they take a tool, to, can be a vice but it could be a, a tool similar, and they put pressure on it to hold it in place until that glue dries and then you can't rip it apart. It's the pressure that compacts through much trial, through much testing, through much tribulation. All of us are going to go through it. But where do we, where do we go when we're going through it to be built up? That's a good question. The unsaved Go to the corner liquor store, to the bar, to work. Um, you know, they try to they try to forget their problems. You know why drugs are so prevalent in our society today? Because people have problems and they have no solutions. They have no answers. But the saved have the solutions and the answers, but we still go through trials and tribulations, don't we? Yeah. You know where we go to get encouraged? The local church. <clears throat> where men and women of God build us up. Notice here what the apostle says further in the verse. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. You know what? Every one of us is critically important for the edifying of the body to take place. When one of us is missing, we're losing that person's ability to supply something necessary to all of us. And vice versa. They're losing the, the assembly's ability to minister to them, to build them up, to encourage them, to nurture them. Let me give one great example of how this works. Recently, I get a surgery, and I was laid up for a length, um, longer time than I like. And that wasn't able to do a lot of things. You know what encouraged me? Cards and letters from the saints here. A word, just knowing that I was in their prayers and in their thoughts. The other thing that the local assembly does to edify is this is where the work of learning the Word of God really takes place for a lot of people. Now it's interesting. How many people today, honest, raise your hand honestly if you, if you know it, ever thought about how Joseph fit in to the Christmas account, or the birth account, I should say? How many of you ever thought about that? A few. Did you learn something this morning when Dan talked? It's confirming the soul. It's 
building people so that their knowledge increases. Why is it important for the knowledge to increase? Confidence in God. Where's the answers to all of your problems? God. Word the word. It's in the Word of God, right? The more you know the Word of God, the more you get answers to the things that the world is going to bring to bear upon you. And the more answers you have, the better equipped you are. And the better equipped you are, the less likely you are to be tossed to and fro by every slight of wind and doctrine that's a sham. And there's a lot of them out there. It's interesting. The third thing back there in Acts chapter 14 is what brings us here today. The first two are necessary to bring us to the third. Because at some point, somebody had to evangelize our dear brother Dan. At some point, Dan had to have the edification process begin to work in him to lead him to the point of where he is now. Right? Right. Now, notice here in chapter 14 of Acts, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Again, there is a dispensational thing there. We don't fast, for instance, today. It's not necessary. But the principle is still here. And what's this principle? That they would ordain elders. Now, the word elder is literally... Uh, the word presbyteros, and it means a senior member of a celestial body. That's the idea of it. Or a senior member of a of a ecclesiastical body it would be a way somebody else might say it. How are they recognized as a senior member? It's not necessarily age, as far as years, but maturity. It's a mature person in the Lord. It's somebody who understands the doctrines, knows how to apply those doctrines, has the ability to communicate those doctrines, has a heart to evangelize others, has the heart to bring people to edification, and doesn't grow weary in all that work. That's a lot. <laughs> has a care for everybody within that local assembly. Now, this edification process is the idea of raising up men. And the Apostle Paul in, in Titus, which we read today, if you want to go with me there, Titus chapter number 1, notice here what the Apostle Paul is saying. Now, he sent Titus to the church in Crete. And the church in Crete is a mess. It's an absolute rock. And he sends Titus there with the purpose of setting things in order. Notice chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. How do you set the things that are wanting in order? Ordain elders in every city. You ordain elders in every city, and notice the next thing, as I had appointed thee. Now the word appointed is the same word translated ordained in the King James. In other words, you could read it this way. Appoint elders in every city as I had appointed thee, or ordain elders in every city as I had ordained thee. In other words, Titus was ordained through Paul's ministry. Paul himself refers to the fact that he had been ordained. Who ordained him? Jesus Christ himself, right? It's the perpetuating of church history. How does church history perpetuate itself? Brother Scott raises up Dan. Dan raises up Dan. Dan, hopefully, at some point in the future, will raise up somebody else. Notice what's not recorded here. 
You don't send somebody away to some seminary and yeah. have them learn some principles in a seminary to how, on how to run a business and take a bunch of business management courses to run a local assembly. <laughs> the qualification, and we'll get to that in a minute, is that he's faithful. Yes. And this is important. Notice here he comes in and he says, if any be blameless. Now, the word blameless means of above reproach. None of us are blameless. We all have things that we do wrong. And we will continue to do wrong until we receive a new glorified body. But it means he's above reproach. His character is one of the highest regard where we can look at him and we see Brother Dan and we, we want to be like that. We see there's something different because his character is the very character of our Lord and Savior. He manifests that in his life. Right? The husband of one wife. Notice it doesn't say having many mistresses and things like that. Right? right. The idea is that he has this idea of fidelity with his partner. And it's important. It's important because she is going to be partaking in his ministry. That, that's the absolute truth. And what they're doing, they're doing as, as a team, so to speak. There's going to be days when you come home and you're going to want to beat your head against the door because you're going to be looking at it and you're saying, you're just not getting it. Or, I don't know, I don't have the answers to this particular thing. <coughs> and your best sounding board is your spouse. Mm -hmm. It really is. He says, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. Well, what does that mean? That you have a child, children who are faithful to the Word of God, that they're not going out rioting or getting in. I, I think of it today, if I was to put it in modern vernacular, not doing gang-related behaviors or hoodlum-related behaviors. Right? He's somebody you can look at and it's a fine, upstanding young man. And again, none of us are perfect until we attain perfection at resurrection. He goes on, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. The word bishop is simply the word overseer. Mm -hmm. Same word. Uh, must be blameless as the steward. A steward is a house manager. What house is he managing? The local ecclesiast, the local ecclesia, the local church. He's faithful in that ministry that has been given to him. He, he, he he functions in a way that's good. Notice here it says, not self-will. Dan meets the qualifications today because his will isn't to bring glory to himself. He's not self-will. He wants to bring glory to our Lord and Savior. In that sense, he's god will. His desire is to glorify our Savior. So he's not self will Not soon angry. You can honestly say, I don't think he has an angry bone in his body. At least I haven't seen it. <laughs> now I don't live with him. And I know <laughs> it's different when you do. Um, and, and we all do things, you know, we all, we all have a temper at some point. But the idea there is to be angry without a reasonable cause. The Lord himself was angry. Remember, he overturned the tables of the money changers. Um, there's, there's anger that's justified, and there's anger that's not justified. What it's talking about here is the anger that's not justified. Now, again, that doesn't mean that won't ever happen. It will. <laughs> Um, he's, he's a person awaiting resurrection. But is a, is, is a norm, it doesn't. 
not given to wine that is self-explanatory. No striker. In other words, he doesn't go about picking a fight, a fist fight. Um, not given to filthy lucre. Lucre is money. In other words, not given to money. That's the idea where he has a love of money. Now, money itself isn't evil. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 6, it's the love mm -hmm. of money. In other words, your desire is to money. When it's to that, it will take you away from the things of God. So we, we have to understand here that he's not a given to filthy lucre. In other words, his desire isn't to get rich in the ministry. If it was, trust me, he'd be in a different church. <laughs> okay? And I don't say that in a negative way to the folks here. But let's be honest. A church that has 500 members is going to support you much better than a church that has 20. Yeah. Right? That's just the reality. So that's the idea he's getting at. Notice the last thing here that's really important. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for, there's that word again, filthy lucre sack. Mm -hmm. In other words, what is one of the things that is now entrusted into our dear brother Dan? That he holds fast, he holds firm, he is unmovable to the word of God and the doctrines of God. Now what doctrine? The ones that the Apostle Paul had committed to Timothy. The ones that the Apostle Paul had committed to Titus, and Titus committed to men in Crete, and the men in Crete committed to other people, until it spread to the United States of America, and then has been given to other men, and other men, and other men, generation after generation after generation. Why? Because the Lord has tarried in coming. And, and there has to be a place where the saints of God can come and be built up. There has to be a place where the unsaved can hear what God has accomplished for them. And in order for that to work, there has to be individuals who have the ability to tie all that in together and to, and to devote their life to doing that. That's church history. Church history is not the writings of Augustine. That's theology. Church history is real men rolling up their sleeves, going to work, learning this book so that they can know Him. And the more they know Him, the more they live as He would. The more they live as He would, the greater they are as a witness to all that they come into contact with and evangelize. The more they evangelize, some are going to want the truth. Then they're going to come in to a building to be exhorted, to be edified, to be lifted up. But again, it begins with a teaching ministry. It begins with a ministry that understands the Word of God. It begins with a ministry that doesn't compromise truth. But when it's wrong, it admits that it's wrong and adjusts accordingly. You can never be ashamed of admitting you're wrong in adjusting. No. But there are those whose mouths need to be stopped. Who are those people? There's a lot of humanists out there that elevate man at the expense of God. Their mouths must be stopped. There are believers who are out there that would minimize what Christ accomplished and try to make sin still an issue. Try to say that, that you've got to clean up your own life. That you've got to get good enough for God to accept you. Their mouths must be stopped with some doctrine. Mm -hmm. Because you will never clean up your life to be good enough for God to accept you. The reason God accepts you is He accepted the sacrifice of His Son who Amen. gave Himself yeah. for you. People try to elevate themselves by saying, believe what I believe, and anyone who doesn't is going to some place where God tortures them endlessly. 
their mouths must be stopped because my God is not a sadistic, heinous, hideous being who will torture people endlessly. That's right. He's a God of love. His standard of justice is not my standard of justice. My standard of justice is I want the bad guy to get it. His standard of justice is I want to rehabilitate that bad guy so he can serve and function in a way I intend him to. And I will rehabilitate him. Yes. And that might be the greatest challenge for our dear brother Dan. Amen. When you come into contact with people who don't want to be rehabilitated <laughs> and who will actively work against you, to undermine the things that you're doing. The Apostle Paul, when he was leaving Ephesus, remember that touching account in Acts chapter 20? He's getting ready to depart. He had spent three years with them, day and night teaching them, laboring with them, teaching in a public and in a personal setting. And then he says that there are many that will be raised up among them that will have a love of other things. And they will devour individuals within the church and lead them astray. When you come into contact with people like that, Paul called them Judaizers in his day. He had the Judaizers. He had the philosophers in Colossians. They're out there. And oftentimes they'll be from within. I remember the first time I met your dad. And I'm not exaggerating this. I came here for a service one night. I actually was I think a speaker, and there were chairs that went all the way back. The sound room wasn't even there. And it went back, and every chair in here was full. But you know what happens? The more you understand truth, the fewer people are willing to walk. And it gets lonely. The more truth you know, the fewer and fewer will come because they'll be content to stay where they are for whatever reason, not willing to continue. And your great challenge is to continue and to bring those people along. But if they won't come along, to leave the door open so that the day may come when they'll come back and want it up. I remember for years, and your dad and I drifted. Not that we were angry with one another, we weren't. We just were going different ways in our ministry at the time. But you know what happened? We kept searching scriptures, kept learning, kept growing. We went like this. Yeah, that's right. And now, I look at him as a second dad. I love Dan. Yeah. I love you too. And I know that you will be as faithful to the word as your dad was. And I know that the word is real. And it builds you up. And it energizes you. I've seen you grow. And it's been an exciting thing to see. I remember the first time when, when you were up here teaching. And I was excited beyond belief just seeing a different face up and teaching. <laughs> this last conference we had was wonderful, where we had different people that we normally don't get a chance to hear. Because the body is making an increase of itself. The ministry isn't one person. That's right. The ministry is many people. There's times Dan's going to need to be built up by all of you. He's going to need encouragement from you. He's going to need to, to have that edification process that you supply in his life for him to go on. Because it can get hard. I want to end with one other passage, and it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others. 
Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Today, man, you're becoming a soldier. And now it's your job to raise up the next generation, to perpetuate their church history, to find those faithful servants of God that won't be swayed or moved or cave in to the pressures that this world brings, but are faithful and are committed to standing firm. Mm -hmm. So that the truths of God, that the God would want us to know, are not extinguished. And every year, Dan will tell you, every year it gets a little darker in this country. God is light. And we emanate light in the message we speak. But that light is being extinguished very rapidly mm -hmm. as our society becomes more and more God-hating. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't say, you know, more and more God-indifferent. It's a God-hating society. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to do away with all the, all the teaching that there's an authority other than a person. Nobody, they, people don't want to be under a different authority. They want to be their own authority. So it's going to be more difficult for you to do that task than it was for us. Because even in school, schools want nothing to do with God today. They hate God. They want to eradicate God. So it becomes difficult. But it's your task to find those faithful men and to build them up. So that the day comes, you can be standing here and you can have the joy of seeing someone else going into the ministry. And as they're going into the ministry, you, you can say, as the Apostle Paul did, I have fought a good fight. Mm -hmm. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give me, but not only to me, but to all those that love his dear son. Mm -hmm. That's the work of the local church. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful task. And it's an honor to hear the joins. Shall we bow to the word of God? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to be able to look into your word. We thank you for the fact that your word reveals these things. That we do not have to guess on what it is that we're supposed to do as a local church. That we don't even have to guess on how it is that the local church is to perpetuate itself. But you laid out the blueprint for us. And you gave us the information and not only have you given us all that stuff, but you've also given us your very spirit who can teach us and instruct us and give us understanding into your work. That's a wonderful thing. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our dear brother Dan's ministry as he begins to start it this day. We ask that uh, it would be fruitful, that many would be evangelized because of him. Not only would they be evangelized, that, but many would come into the local church and they would be edified. And that out of those that have come into the local church and are being edified, that one or two or a dozen would be faithful people so that they could be raised up to perpetuate the process until you come. And we give you all praise, glory, and honor in our Lord and Savior's most precious name we pray. Amen.